with Ochan Brahm's permission. Very good evening to you, all of you, brothers and sisters in the Dharma. It's so good to see so many of you, even though it's Christmas Eve tonight. As you all know, Ajahn Brahm was born in England. He was educated in Cambridge, graduated first class, and fortunately for us, he became a monk. And we are very grateful to Ajahn Brahm, who has been coming over to Penang for many years now to teach us the true Dharma. For that, we are truly grateful to Ajahn Brahm. And with that, I would like to invite Ajahn Brahm to give us tonight's Dharma teachings. Very good. So the title of tonight's talk is Superstitions. <laughs> and because, as was said in the introduction, I had my upbringing born and grown up in London, went to a good school and got scholarships from school to university and studied physics. So I was a scientist. <laughs> and so as a scientist who then became a Buddhist monk, some of the superstitions which I've seen around, I feel they have no scientific basis at all. And it is not as if some of those superstitions are harmless. Some of them are actually very harmful to you. So tonight I was going to talk about some superstitions and the way that really you should throw them away because they hurt your hip pocket, they don't work, and they just keep you in stupidity. And one of the most dangerous things about superstitions is there is another thing which you usually could do, and being superstitious means you usually follow a wrong path when you should be doing something better. And one of the reasons why in countries like Australia, Europe, United States, even South America, why Buddhism is growing stronger and stronger every year is because from the very early beginnings Buddhism wasn't superstitious while well, many other religions are. And because of the lack of superstition in original Buddhism people who have a good education in Western countries really like being Buddhists. A good example of that at a conference I went to a couple of years ago, the Swedish delegate, who was a monk, he made the announcement that the Swedish government had done a survey in every high school in Sweden. So every boy and girl in high school had to answer a series of questions given by the government. One of those questions was, if you had to choose a religion, which religion would you choose? And so all the children had to answer that question, from 11 to 18 year olds. 60%, 60% wrote down Buddhism. And this was in Sweden, and this is the future of that country. It was Buddhism was the religion they wanted to choose, 60%. So why do people like to choose Buddhism? A lot of time it is because it is not superstitious. It's according to science. It's rational. It makes sense. And because it's rational and it makes sense, it works. However, you know what it's like? Buddhism has been in Asia for 2,500 years. And sometimes many superstitions have grown up around Buddhism. And these are superstitions which some of us, we can't distinguish. We think that that's Buddhism. But for those of you who've read the early books, you know that wasn't Buddhism at all. This is just something which has grown up over the years and it's not really necessary. Let's take an example. Sometimes, those of you who've been to countries like Thailand know that many Thai Buddhists like to wear medallions around their necks. 
And I've seen some people wearing so many medallions around their necks, it must give them a neck ache. <laughs> and you ask them, why do you wear those medallions? And they say, because it protects me from bad luck and from evil. And some of those medallions are so expensive because people believe they can do all sorts of things, all sorts of magical properties. And I remember reading this story in the newspapers in Australia. It got that far all throughout the world. A few years ago, there was a Thai general. You know the generals are very wealthy. He paid 500,000 US dollars for one medallion. Half a million. And the reason why is this medallion was supposed to stop bullets. And he was a general. Sometimes in coups and in battles, some people shoot bullets at you. But this medallion would protect you. So he thought it was a good thing to buy. And one evening, he was having a drink in the officer's mess, their club. And maybe it was because he'd drunk too much whiskey. He boasted to one of his other officers, see this medallion here? This cost me half a million bucks and it stops bullets. Really? Yeah, really. Really? Yeah, here's my gun, shoot me. <laughs> and the other officer took the gun and shot him and killed him. <laughs> All because he thought that that would save him from bullets. It was not only $500,000 US wasted, it cost him his life. So please, any of you, if you see any of these medallions, they're not going to protect you from anything, except Ajahn Chah's story. If you haven't heard this story, that once this man came to see Ajahn Chah and said, can you give me one of these medallions, one of these little Buddhas I can wear around my neck to protect me from bullets? Now, good forest monks don't give out those medallions because we don't follow superstition. You look in the early text, did the Buddha ever give away medallions? No. This is new Buddhism, it's what we call commercial Buddhism because you raise a lot of money that way. But that's really not being a good Buddhist. So Ajahn Chah would never give out medallions. Never. Only on this one occasion. Well, he actually didn't give him it to him, he offered it to him. Because the man said, look, I've just been drafted into the Thai army and I've been looking after you for such a long time and you always talk about gratitude. Now out of gratitude, can you give me a Buddha to wear around my neck to keep me out of danger, to stop bullets? And the, Buddha, the Ajahn Chah said, no, I can't do that. Yes, I know you can. Give me one. And this man was so persistent that after a while Ajahn Chah gave in. He said, okay, okay, I can give you a Buddha to wear around your neck which I, Ajahn Chah, guarantee will stop bullets. Oh, thank you, Sadhu, 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 where is it? And Ajahn Chah said, it's that big Buddha in the main hall. <laughs> Wear that around your neck, <laughs> and I guarantee it will stop bullets. <laughs> and that's the... <laughs> That's the only medallion which will stop bullets. It has to be that big. <laughs> these, <laughs> these small ones don't. But the thing is that people just, they want to believe and they have all these superstitions. It's not only medallions and little Buddhas which will stop bullets and stop harm. Sometimes they think that monks can do that too. And so they had the tradition, and I think it's still the case in Thailand, if you go on a bus, 
they always put the monk in the front seat. <laughs> they do. They still do that? They still do that. You know why? Because with the monk in the front seat, his good karma will prevent any head-on collisions. Because <laughs> if anyone's going to get killed, the monk gets killed first, and that can't happen because of the good karma of the monk. So we protect them. And I still remember this one time I was in the town of Chonburi and I was being put on a bus to go into Bangkok and as soon as the driver saw me get on the bus, even though he knew I was not going to pay, and actually we did have a ticket, he smiled, he grinned, oh thank you, thank you, please get on the front seat. The reason was because this was one of the buses which had a TV screen on the front and he was really interesting watching the TV. So as he was driving along this highway, about 120, 130 kilometers an hour, he was watching the TV almost all the time. And he knew he was safe because I was sitting in the front. <laughs> but I was getting terrified because all these big trucks were coming towards me and he just missed them at the last moment. <laughs> that was really, really dangerous. But you know, I tried that once on Thai Airways. I said, to make sure your plane is safe, do you want to put me up the front? Because <laughs> you know up the front in an aircraft, that means upgrade into business class or first class. <laughs> they say, no, 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 you sit in the back with everybody else. <laughs> but those sorts of superstitions, now that was dangerous, because I could have got killed simply because that man thought, now there is a monk in the front seat, I am safe, therefore I don't need to be careful. And that's one of the problems with superstitions. If you're wearing medallions, you think, now I'm safe, I don't need to be careful. If you're wearing strings around your wrist, like they do in Sri Lankan Buddhism, you think, now I'm safe, I don't need to care. Or if you've got holy water today, or if you had chanting, you think, I don't need to do any work on my studies, I'm going to pass anyway, because I've had holy water today. There was a woman once, actually many times, we always get a lot of people coming for chanting in the temple just before the end of school exams. <laughs> you know why they're coming? Because they've got important exams in a day or two's time, and they want to get some chanting for good luck. And this, a lot of time, that chanting, it gives you a morale boost. It gives you confidence, but that's all it gives you. It can't answer the questions for you. You have to do that. But nevertheless, this woman came up and she wanted some chanting. So we gave her some chanting. We never saw her again. But her friends told us why. Because this young lady was going around telling everybody, Ajahn Brahm and his monks are no good. She kept on saying we were no good. You know why? Because she failed. And she blamed me for not being able to chant with enough power to get her through her exams. <laughs> and the point was that you know, her friends told us we all know, knew that she was going to fail because she never went to lectures, she never did her assignments, she never did any work, she just went to parties. I think she was a Malaysian girl sent over by her family to study in Australia and without her family behind her she just partied and went to clubs and went with boys rather than studying. And she had hoped, you know, one or few two days before the exams, get some chanting from the holy monks and that will fix things for her. And of course it didn't. So people who believe that these things will fix up all your troubles are wasting time. She would have done much better if she'd have stayed at home instead of going to the temple and took out her books and did some work, did some revision. Because a lot of time those superstitions, they are dangerous. You're wasting time on things which don't work. It's the same when you have a sickness. Sure that monks can do some chanting for you, but please, if you've got cancer, please go and see a doctor as well. If you've got a broken leg, don't think that Ajahn Brahm can chant and it just all gets healed again. <coughs> so
So you have to be practical about these things. The classic story about how superstition can cost lives was a case in the south of Malaysia a few years ago when there were really heavy floods. And there was a temple there, a Buddhist temple, where the Sifu was devoted to the goddess of mercy, Kuan Yin. And so when the floods came, he climbed up on the roof because everything was flooded. And a boat came, a rescue boat. And when the rescue boat came close to the roof, they shouted out, Sifu, venerable monk, please jump in the boat, we've come to rescue you. And the Sifu replied, you don't need to rescue me. I am a devotee of the goddess of mercy, Kuan Yin. She will save me. I've been praying and looking after her all my life. I don't need no rescue boats. Kuan Yin will save me. Don't be stupid, monk. Jump in. No, I've got faith in Kuan Yin. So they couldn't waste time arguing with the venerable. They had to go off and rescue other people. And you know what happened? The waters rose. So then he was on those curly bits at the end of temples, hanging on. When another boat came, and the boat said, Venerable, we've heard about you. This is the last boat. Jump in. We've come to save you. You've proved you have faith in Kuan Yin. Now come on, jump in. Don't be silly. He said, no, no, no. This is a test of my faith. Ah, Kuan Yin will save me for sure. Go away. And of course they couldn't convince the monk to jump in. So they had to go away. And what happened? The waters rose. Now he was hanging on to his TV aerial. <laughs> the last thing. And a helicopter came. And the helicopter dropped its rope ladder and said, Sifu, grab on to the end of the ladder. The waters are still rising. We've come to save you. And he shouted up, No need. I have faith in Kuan Yin. She will save me. Don't be silly. I'm not being silly. <laughs> and no matter what they said or shouted, he would not grab onto the end of the rope. So they had to fly away. You know what happened? He drowned. <laughs> he died. So when he went to heaven, he was really upset. <laughs> he was really angry, especially when he saw Kuan Yin. <laughs> I had faith in you. I believed in you. And you embarrassed me in front of everybody. Why didn't you save me? And Kuan Yin said with a very sweet smile, What do you mean, Sifu? I didn't do anything. I sent you two boats and one helicopter. <laughs> so I think now, now you know the danger of superstition. You have to be practical in this life. It's all right to go praying but you have to take advantage of the things which come to you in life and then you'll be happy and successful. So that's why Buddhism from the very early said have common sense. If you want to be successful in life, work hard. If you want to pass your examinations, getting a bunch of joss sticks and just uh, put him in your hands and shaking him backwards and forwards is nowhere near as useful as uh, you know, revising or looking at the books. If you want to um, find that beautiful girl and marry her, you know, going to a temple which is a lucky temple for finding a partner in life and giving a donation is nowhere near as successful as using that money to straighten your teeth and get a proper hairstyle. <laughs> so you have to be practical because most people use religion as just a superstition 
and they never question it. They never ask and, and look carefully into it. What are these things? You know the chanting. The chanting began when the monks had to remember the teachings of the Buddha. So all those chants which we sometimes recite you know, in temples, they were there because in the earliest times we didn't have books. Because we didn't have books, the monks had to memorize these sermons. And they'd memorize them by chanting and chanting and chanting and chanting them until they knew them off by heart. And that's the only way they could preserve the early teachings of the Buddha, the sutras, by chanting them. So that's where the chanting came from. It was a way of memorizing the teachings in a time we didn't have books. Now not only do we have books, we have internet. So now you don't need to even memorize the teachings or even print them out in books. You can actually get on the internet and get the whole of the Tripitaka in whatever language you want. But nevertheless, people think, oh, the chanting, the chanting is really holy and very, very powerful. The chanting is not powerful. Only if it comes from a good monk or a good nun, it's the power of the one who chants makes it powerful, not the chant itself. Otherwise, otherwise, why wouldn't you, say, train a parrot to chant the Metta Sutta? It's just as good. Or how about this? In Japan, I don't, when you do funeral services in Penang, do you have the monks doing chanting for you? You have monks doing chanting? You know there's not that many monks in Penang and sometimes they're very, very busy. So sometimes it's quite hard to get a good monk to do chanting at funeral service for you. And it's also very expensive too. And that was also the case in Japan until recently. So someone in Japan figured out a nice way to solve the problem. And this is no joke, it's true. They built a robot monk. <laughs> a cyber monk. So it looks just like a monk. They've got a robe on, it's got like, the hair, and it's got just a face which looks just like a monk. But it's not a real monk, it's a robot. And you put the CD in the back, whatever chanting you want, and the monk, he chants perfectly every time. And it's true. So in their funeral parlors, they got robot monk. He does perfect chanting. And it's just so beautiful chanting. You know, sometimes monks have got a cough. Sometimes they know their throat's a bit sore. This robot, his voice is always perfect every time. And doesn't cost any money. Just, I don't know how many sort of uh, yen for the electricity. But apparently in this funeral parlor, just to make it interesting, as soon as the monk is finished the chanting, they arranged it so he actually levitates up in the air and goes through a trap door in the ceiling with all these clouds of dry ice. Apparently it's very popular. <laughs> is that just as good as getting a real monk? Having a robot monk? <laughs> what do you think? People say, no, no, I want a real monk or a real nun. And actually, you've got a point there, because if the monk does do chanting, it really depends upon the power of that monk's mind, whether it works or not. So it's nothing to do with the words. The words are just the way the monk focuses. But it's the power of the monk's mind working through that chant. Now, that does have power, because I've seen that many, many, many times. And perhaps the most interesting story is of the monk with the diplomatic visa. A few years ago, in our monastery in the United States, a Thai monk was visiting. And my friend picked him up at the airport. And once he came through the customs, he decided to just check the visa in his passport to make sure everything was in order. 
and he looked at this monk's visa. He was just an old Thai forest monk and noticed he had a diplomatic visa with no expiry date, allowing this Thai monk to come into the United States whenever he wanted, for however long he wanted, for the rest of his life, through the diplomatic channel. And he wondered, how on earth did this monk get this special visa in a time of homeland security? This was after 9-11. How did he get a visa like this? Just as a Thai monk, a diplomatic visa with no expiry date. And the monk told the following story, which was checked out to be true. A few years earlier, he just happened to be in the Thai temple in Houston, Texas. And at that time, NASA, the National Aeronautical and Space Administration, at their headquarters in Houston, were installing a new mainframe computer system worth hundreds of millions of dollars. This was the state-of-the-art number cruncher for the headquarters of NASA. And having installed it, they could not boot it up. They couldn't get it to work. So they invited the best experts from you, throughout the United States. Come quickly, because this is costing us millions of dollars every day when it's down. And all the greatest professors and engineers throughout the whole of the US could not fix that computer. But one of the engineers working in NASA was a Thai boy and he said well if the best engineers can't fix this perhaps it could be supernatural <laughs> <laughs> and I know just a monk who can fix such things he's right now in the temple just down the road moreover monks don't cost anything just a cup of tea is all we charge. <laughs> so they had nothing to lose. So they sent a car, picked up the monk, brought him into the mainframe computer house in NASA, having put him through all this security quickly. And what did he do? He sat meditation for a few minutes and did some chanting. And then the computer worked perfectly. <laughs> it did. And because of that, they were so grateful that they used their contacts. This is NASA. They've got big contacts. They used all of their contacts to get this monk a diplomatic visa with no expiry date, just in case they needed him again in a hurry. <laughs> now, that's a true story, which shows that maybe sometimes this chanting does have some power. But it really depends upon the person doing it. It's nothing in the chanting. It's just actually in the person, whether they really develop their meditation for a long time or not. But most of the time, monks don't mess around with things like that. That's not what chanting is for, fixing computers. What it's really there for is learning the dhammas to make a more peaceful and kind mind. But nevertheless, I started mentioning chanting, and sometimes chanting, yeah, sometimes it can work. I know especially... Some of the Buddhist monks are very good for, for ghost chanting. Now this is actually true. Of all the religions, the Buddhist monks are always the best for getting rid of ghosts. Especially Western monks. <laughs> you know why? Because our chanting, when Western monks chanting, it's so bad that no ghost can stand it and they run away. <laughs> oh no, not more Western monks chanting. <laughs> Now that's only a bit of a joke. But it's true because it's the power of the person doing the chanting. That's what scares the ghosts away, not the words themselves. Look and think about it. There's a monk, say maybe one of the monks from the Sri Lankan temple here, they chant in Pali. How many Penang ghosts understand Pali? 
Not even you understand Pali, so how can a ghost understand Pali? The ghost will think, what the heck is this Sifu talking about? <laughs> no, it's nothing to, it's nothing to do with the, the chant, it's the power of the monk doing it. So yeah, that does have power, so you can, that's not superstition because I've seen those things. And so as, as a scientific monk, I will only follow those things which I've seen and proved for myself. So chanting is okay. Now, holy water, have you seen it do anything? Sometimes it's good, it does have an effect. On a hot day it cools you down. <laughs> so I was noticing, speaking of the holy water this morning, oh it's very nice because it's hot morning and people really love it. But that's why holy water is not very popular in places like England. It's too cold. <laughs> But I do remember, this is how Ajahn Chah looked at holy water. There was this one time another general came to see him. Now I mentioned generals in Thailand because not many politicians came because the generals were the ones with the power and they still are in, in many ways in Thailand. So this big, I don't know if it was major general or whatever came to see Ajahn Chah and he asked for some holy water. Now Ajahn Chah doesn't have holy water. He doesn't do holy water. But this was a general and he demanded holy water. So Ajahn Chah said, come closer. So just bow down. And so he bowed down in front of Ajahn Chah. He wanted some holy water, okay? <laughs> That's what he did. Ajahn Chah spat on the general's head. And he didn't stop there, he got his hand and rubbed it in. And when I saw that, and a few other monks saw that, they were thinking, oh my goodness, he's gone too far this time. <laughs> you can't spit on a general's head. You, mean, you know that in Thailand, the head is the highest part. And to spit on it and rub it in, he's going to get his soldiers and kill Ajahn Chah, and us as well. But no, the general loved every moment of this. Oh, this is special. You can't get more holy than the mouth of a great monk. <laughs> Ajahn Chah was very, very lucky. <laughs> so that's superstition, but he got away with it. As for me, my holy water story, you know, over in Thailand, when I was a young monk, once a week, on the full moon, new moon, and the weeks in between those two days, the monks would stay up all night meditating. So we wouldn't have any sleep that day. So I just finished you know, the, the last meditation you know, of the night. And it doesn't matter how good meditation you have, you know, by the end of the morning you're pretty tired and dull. So I was a bit you know, drowsy. My mindfulness wasn't strong. And I went outside the hall to urinate. Now these were forest monasteries, so we u usually urinate in the bush. You know, just squat down and urinate on the, uh, on the twigs and the, uh, the leaves. So it was just at dawn. So number one, my mindfulness wasn't strong. Number two, the light wasn't very good. And it was just first, uh, first light in the morning. And I squatted down to urinate. And it was such a relief because we'd been meditating a long time. And I thought I was urinating on a, a stick. And then the stick started to move. <laughs> now remember how we urinate in Asia, you squat down. You don't stand up, you squat down. So you men would understand the most sensitive part of my body was about this far from the snake's mouth. <laughs> that was very dangerous. But what did that snake do? Did it bite me when I peed on it? Of course not. Because the snake thought, this is holy water from Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> You can't get more holy than that. <laughs> so I think maybe even snakes are superstitious. <laughs> Thankfully so. But be careful because much superstition can actually cost you your life. There is a story which was told to me by a, a Sri Lankan professor. And he was a close friend of a very famous Sri Lankan Buddhist called Professor Jayatilaki. 
If you go into the library downstairs, you'll find some books written by this quite well-known Buddhist scholar in Sri Lanka who died in his mid-forties. And one of his friends, school friends, told me why he died. Because of superstition killed him. What had happened, as a young man, you know, in his early twenties, he heard of this fortune teller in Sri Lanka who was quite famous. Uh, just to have a look, just to have a seat, because you know, you're a young man, young woman, you know, it's just a bit of entertainment interest to see if this fortune teller was any good. So he went there and the fortune teller looked at him and said, you're going to marry a girl by the name of Kumaratugama Bungama, whatever it is. Sri Lankan names are very long, and not even I can remember them all. Apparently, this was actually a story I saw in um, Australia. You know the horse racing? Do you, if you've ever seen the horse racing you know, in Penang or other places, when the horses come close to the finish line, the, uh, the announcer you know, has to sort of announce their names. And, and it's... Uh, a red apple is just about to be blue mango and they're just coming up and blue mango is about to be red apple and they have to speak very loud, very fast and even in Sri Lanka the horses' names are also very long just like Sri Lankan people's names and they were so long the man who was actually announcing the names at the end of the final of the race had a heart attack, he couldn't do it and he died <laughs> so Sri, Lank Sri Lankan names are very, very long so anyway this fortune teller predicted the name of the woman who's going to marry him and he didn't even know such a person didn't even know anyone of that family but later on he married her without any possibility of, of knowing this girl this fortune teller predicted it accurately and that really impressed him that was just too much of a coincidence so from that time on, this Professor Jayatilaki believed in this fortune teller. And the fortune teller also told him on one consultation that you will live to a ripe old age. You won't die until your 80s. And of course, Professor Jayatilaki believed him. That's what superstition is. And when he got to in his 40s, he got sick. But of course, he never bothered to go and see the doctor. The reason why is because he was going to live to 80s. What do you need to see a doctor for? And because he never went to see the doctor, he died at 45. And the person who told me that story, who was a personal friend of this man, said, if he hadn't gone to see that fortune teller, if he hadn't heard that he was going to live to a ripe old age and believed it, then he would have gone and seen the doctor in time. He would have been cured and he would be alive today. It was just the belief which killed him. Now there must be something about superstition that when I get to the interesting part we get this loud noise here. <laughs> because that must be the bad spirits. They don't want you to believe that superstition is wrong. So they're trying to stop the talk tonight by this loud music <laughs> next door. Because sometimes when you don't believe in these spirits and these ghosts, sometimes, and how many of you are so superstitious that you know, they think there's a spirit in the house and you get really upset and afraid? I know because I'm a monk that actually ghosts are afraid of you. So the next time you see a ghost, look it in the eye and say, don't come again or else, get out. And the ghosts do get out. This is a story from one of my fellow monks. He was staying in one of these monasteries over in north of, east of Thailand, which was famous for its ghosts. Heaps of ghosts all over the place. And one day he was meditating, just like you meditators meditate, and he got a bit tired. So he leant against the wall and put his feet out. And then he felt something 
grab hold of his foot and pull it. And first of all he thought, that must be a good spirit, must be a deva trying to wake me up so I can carry on meditating. But this happened not just once, it happened several times. And soon he realized, this was not a deva, this was not a good spirit. This was one of those naughty spirits. Because even when he was sitting up straight, he would sort of uh, pull his leg or tap him on the shoulder. And it also became, he knew that when this thing came into his hut, it always started coming in with a very bad smell. And a bad smell knows, and that's a sign, it's a very bad spirit. And it was always messing him around. So one day, this is how he solved the problem. He told me, he smelt the ghost coming in. So he said to the ghost, Right, you sit here and meditate with me and behave yourself or get out. He was really firm with the ghost. And that's the last time the ghost came in. So if you have a ghost in the house, you try the same. Right, ghost, sit down and meditate and behave, or get out. <laughs> and it works. I know those things work. So you don't need to be superstitious. Again, I said I was a scientist, and one of my fellow uh, scientists, a good friend, was a man called Dr. Tony Cornell. And he became the head ghost hunter in Great Britain and Northern Ireland. In UK they have a society called the Psychic Research Society and one of their branches is to investigate scientifically all ghost hauntings in the country of England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And he became the head ghost hunter and he was a personal friend of mine. Last October I went to England, I had uh, lunch with his wife, unfortunately he was too sick to come to lunch. He was about to become a ghost himself. <laughs> <laughs> but he had some amazing stories to tell because he was the expert. He was a professor, a scientist, a doctor, but also his hobby was investigating ghosts, real ones. And he told us, which I already knew, that throughout all of the research they've done on ghosts in England, and they're famous for their ghosts in England, never once, not one time, in over 150 years, has a ghost ever hurt a human being. The truth of the matter is, they cannot hurt you. And he told me personally, he's been in rooms and cups have been flying through the air. But they always miss you. Eggs have been coming through the, the wall of the refrigerator and just whizzing just right past his ear. But never hitting him. And he says he does not know why but all the evidence accumulated over 150 years has proved that ghosts can't hurt you. They can make you scared if you are someone who's superstitious, but they cannot harm you at all. It must, some unwritten law. So now you know that, you don't need to be afraid. Next time you see a ghost, you say, Oh, Ajahn Brahm told me you can't hurt me. <laughs> nah, 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 you can't hurt me. <laughs> and you don't need to be afraid, because they can't hurt you. That's true. <laughs> so you don't need to be afraid, so don't be superstitious. Superstition lives on the lack of knowledge. When you don't know, then of course you can be superstitious. When you don't know how chanting works, you can be superstitious. You don't know how holy water works, you can be superstitious. You don't know how fortune telling works, because fortune tellers, sometimes they get it right, most times they get it wrong. That's what happens with fortune tellers. And just because they get it right once, doesn't mean you can believe them all the time. 
So be really careful with fortune tellers. Certainly do not believe in a poor fortune teller. Go and see where they live. Look at their car. See if you can see what sort of clothes they can afford. And if they're really as poor as you are, if they can't tell their own fortune, how do you think they can tell yours? <laughs> so never believe in a poor fortune teller. You know why? Because we are superstitious. We think actually people can tell the fortune. Actually you can't. Because the future is far too uncertain. And even if you actually do find out you know, what the future is, sometimes you don't understand it. You don't know what it really is until after it happens. I know there are many, many people in Penang who like to gamble. I already mentioned horse racing. Do you remember that story I told a few years ago of the man who dreamt of the five angels? I think a few of you haven't heard this story. This happened in Perth in Western Australia. This man, he had this very vivid dream of five angels. And every angel had five pots of gold. And they lined up to give this man 25 pots of gold. It would be worth a fortune. And when he received his, his fifth pot of gold from the fifth angel, he woke up. And he was in his bedroom. He looked around and there were no davis. But even worse, no pots of gold. <laughs> it was only a dream. So he went down, got dressed and went down for breakfast. And he could not believe that that morning his wife had made him five boiled eggs with five pieces of toast. Now was this an omen? When he looked at the morning newspaper, it was the 5th of May. The 5th day of the 5th month, he had five boiled eggs, five pieces of toast, and he dreamt of five angels giving him five pots of gold. Somehow or other, the number five must be lucky. So he looked in the back of the newspaper, which in Australia is where you find the horse racing. And that day there's a, a horse racing course in Perth named after an English course called Ascot. A-S-C-O-T. Five letters. He looked in race number five that afternoon and he couldn't believe his eyes when he saw in race number five horse number five was called five angels. Wow! He dreamt of five angels number five was staring him in the face all morning and he thought my goodness this is a sign. So he took the afternoon off work he never told his wife because sometimes women don't understand these things. <laughs> That's what he thought. Actually they understand them much better than men do. He took the afternoon off work. You only get these omens maybe once in a lifetime. So he took five thousand dollars out of the bank. He went to the race course. Just to make sure he chose the fifth bookmaker in line and he put five thousand dollars to win. On horse number five, race number five, five angels. He knew that the number five was a lucky number. He knew that five must be a lucky number and it was a lucky number because his horse came in fifth. <laughs> he lost. And the moral, of that, <laughs> the moral of that story is that sometimes even if we do get a premonition we don't really understand it until after it happened. So don't be so superstitious that when you do get a premonition or you do get some idea of what's happening, it's only afterwards you understand what it would really mean for you. At the time it's just too easy to misinterpret. 
So don't go to fortune tellers. In Penang, when a person gets married, do they go to a fortune teller to get an auspicious date? Do you? Some say yes, some say no. It's an auspicious date now, if you have a good relationship together. But it doesn't matter what date you get married on, if you're not a wise person, you're still going to have lots of arguments <laughs> and lots of suffering. It's got nothing to do with the date. What about something like Feng Shui? Is that important? You know Feng Shui, where you arrange furniture in your house. How do you pronounce that? Feng Shui, okay. Feng Shui. How many of you believe in Feng Shui? <laughs> That's more superstition. You know, in Buddhism, some people believe the Buddha statue must always face east. Which way is east here? That way? My, it's very bad feng shui when this Buddha faces west. So this is actually the same in our monastery in Perth. Because when we built our monastery, we put our Buddha statue facing west. And some people came to complain. Especially when we had a visiting monk from Thailand. He was actually the, the second monk to Ajahn Chah at the time. It was Ajahn Jan. And the Thai people complained. He said, these western monks, they don't know what they're doing. Look, they've got the Buddha statue facing in the wrong direction. Can you, Ajahn Jan, can you please t <coughs> tell these western monks to put it the proper way round? And Ajahn Jan said, listen. If the Buddha wanted to face the other way around, he'd turn around by himself. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so that hasn't turned around, so I must like facing that way, so leave it alone. But some people are that superstitious, and they really think that they have to have everything facing the correct direction. And it's very, very lucky if you get the house with a number eight on it. Or you get number plates with number eight, eight, eight. <laughs> but if you get a number plate with a number four, that's bad luck. What do you mean the number four is bad luck? Haven't you heard of the four noble truths or the four satipatthana? <laughs> that's good luck. It's got nothing to do with the numbers. The same with Feng Shui, you know there was this man in Perth. He was having a bad relationship with his wife. And he went, he went to see psychologists, marriage counselors, nothing was working. So he decided to go and see a Feng Shui expert. And the Feng Shui expert came to his house and said, the problem with your marriage is your furniture is all wrong. Rearrange your furniture and your marriage problems will be solved. So he rearranged his furniture. And he told someone a week later, how's your relationship now? So it's fine now, I rearranged my furniture, there's no problem with my wife. What did you do? Well, when she was out shopping, I pushed all the furniture against the door. Now she can't come in. <laughs> <laughs> so no problem with my marriage anymore. <laughs> so to be to be accurate though, Feng Shui has maybe about one or two percent influence you know, on your fortune, your happiness or whatever. Yeah, there is something about that, but it's only a small amount. The most important part is what you do and how you react and how you practice, what you think, what you say, what you do. That's far more important than Feng Shui. It's far more important than you know, all this string and amulets and chanting. So please don't be superstitious. If you really want to be happy, successful, healthy in your life, all these other superstitions are basically wasting a lot of time. 
The Buddha taught the law of karma. If you want to be successful, you build up your success. You do it. You deserve it. And all these shortcuts with strings and medallions and chant chanting, that's only a small little thing. But what you do is the most important. So unfortunately, that too many people are superstitious in this world. It costs them a lot of money. It has very small returns. And if you really, really, really wanted to be happy, successful and healthy, there's a much better way you can use your money. There's a much better way you can use your time. In a way which isn't following superstition, which is a way which modern people who have studied, who have seen the research, who are scientific in their mind, they know this works. It doesn't matter which way the Buddha faces. It doesn't matter so much whether your house number is number four or number eight. It doesn't matter if you travel on Friday the 13th. Actually, I love traveling on Friday the 13th, especially on aircraft. It's the most fortunate day to travel because there's so many stupid people who are superstitious. Even in economy class, you get two or three seats all to yourself. <laughs> so other people can be stupid and not travel on Friday the 13th. Other people may be stupid and not buy a lovely house or apartment with a number four, which means you can buy it more cheaply. And other people may want to spend a fortune on the number eight, and you save money by getting the number nine instead of the number seven. And that way that you can be a wise, smart person, still be successful, still be happy, still be peaceful, have a wonderful time in life, because superstition most of it is not true. It's just for people who don't know the truth and they get superstition. Oh, one last story. Sometimes you can exploit superstitious people. Because on this one occasion, on this one, there's many superstitious people, even in Europe, unfortunately. On this one occasion, I was staying with my mother, now visiting her a few years ago. And she was cooking my lunch, my dana for the day. I was in her apartment, and there was a knock on the front door of her apartment. When I answered it, it was a gypsy woman trying to sell some trinkets. They were selling it door to door. And when I answered the door, she said, Would you like to buy some gypsy trinkets for good luck? And I said, No, thank you, madam. And I wanted to shut the door. And this woman said, if you don't buy one of my trinkets, I'll put a gypsy curse on you. She threatened to curse me. Now, I wasn't going to stand for that. I was in my monk's robe, so I stood up and said, Madam, I am a Buddhist monk. My curses are much stronger than yours. And I shouldn't have done that. That was not a good thing to do. I admit that. But she looked at me, turned around and ran. <laughs> I certainly got rid of her. But I would never put a curse. There's no such thing as Buddhist curses. But nevertheless, she did believe that. So I used her superstition to get rid of her so I could have my lunch. So if anyone threatens to curse you, you tell them. I know Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Dhammarata and Kai Si. They're great Buddhist monks. I know Venerable Indaratana. If you curse me, I'll get them to curse you. <laughs> and they'll probably run away. So please understand what superstition is. Find out the truth, find out what's real, and all those superstitions which can cause you a lot of pain and difficulty will all disappear. Our oh, one last superstition, and this is pertinent to what we're doing here this week. Some people keep on saying that meditation is dangerous. If you haven't got a teacher and you meditate, you're going to be in big trouble. That is pure superstition. The truth is, if you don't meditate, now that's dangerous. <laughs> so it's much more dangerous if you don't meditate. Meditation is perfectly safe. I've been teaching meditation, actually teaching meditation even before I was a monk, for over 35 years now, and I haven't had a casualty yet. 
Not in 35 years I've got a completely clean slate, a 100% track record. So you don't have to think that meditation is dangerous. It's not. Anyone who says that, they're just superstitious. So carry on meditating. It's not meditating that's dangerous. And don't be superstitious. Thank you for listening. Very good. I know we can hear the music. I hope you can hear us as well. <laughs> Because it's very bad karma to have loud music going into a temple. Be careful of what might happen to you. Be superstitious over there. <laughs> What did they say? Anyway, here we go. <laughs> Questions now coming up. Wow, a triple question. First question here. When people die, they will be reborn. If that is the case, how could a medium able to communicate with the spirits of the dead? And what are told by the spirits by the medium are so accurate and true? Often they are not accurate and true. Sometimes that some people are reborn straight away and they've gone. They can't be contacted at all. But sometimes people are so superstitious and believing that whatever the medium says, I've got a message here from a a man with black hair. Does anyone know a man with black hair? <laughs> yes, I do. You know, he, he was a Buddhist. Yeah, that's my father. <laughs> he used to go to the temple. Yeah, that was him. <laughs> so now be careful because some mediums are good but most of them, they, they rely on your credulity, about your gullibility. Because people want to believe, they do believe. So be careful, because most mediums aren't real. Some are, but most aren't. And they can't tell you very much anyway. Question two, what leads us to choose a particular man or woman as our husband wife, or there are so many good men and man, women in this world? Is it due to karma effect? No, it's just like tossing up a coin, throwing a dice. That's what you might as well do, because sometimes you look at somebody, how can you judge what a person is? Why do you choose your partner in life? Now some because they look nice, but they're not always going to look nice, because they're nice and charming. Yeah, before you get married, they're nice and charming afterwards, are they? <laughs> Now you choose a particular man or woman as our husband and wife. Sometimes you make lucky choices, sometimes not so lucky choices. So be careful, but when you make that choice, it doesn't really, this is a tough thing for me to say, but it's true. It doesn't matter what that choice is, you try and find the best, but a lot of time you can always make it work. It doesn't really matter so much what you do before the marriage, it's what you do once you're married and afterwards, whether you really build up a good relationship together. So it's true that, you know, like a gardener has a good seed, it's much easier to get a good plant. But you know, even with a sort of a poor seed, with lots of hard work, the gardener can make a very beautiful plant. So sometimes, that even you know, when you have arranged marriages, they work out wonderful. And you don't choose, somebody else chooses for you. But you work hard on it. So, but sometimes, some of you meet somebody and you fall in love straight away. Now that can be that it's remembering someone from your previous life. You fall in love with them before and now you carry on from where you left off. And one of the most interesting examples of that is the Hollywood actor John Travolta and his wife Kelly. Because Kelly was born in Australia, that's why I know this story. And you know how they met? How John Travolta met his wife to be Kelly, or rather how Kelly met John. She was a student in Adelaide. One evening she went with her best friend to the movies. 
to see the movie Grease when she saw the poster outside the cinema she turned around to her best friend and said I'm going to marry that man <laughs> that was absolutely crazy she didn't even see him in the flesh she saw a picture of him in the poster outside the cinema in Adelaide and he was in Hollywood and she knew straight away that is the man I'm going to marry and she did and that's one of the longest lasting marriages in the whole of Hollywood John and Kelly Travolta I think about a year ago they lost their son so they're in the newspapers again but they're devoted together that's actually how they met it was love at first sight actually before they really saw each other she just saw a, a photo of him so obviously they had time before and now they have time again our last question here we go uh, I've done this one already Feng Shui is believed to change enhance our luck if that is the case we could use Feng Shui to change our karma tiny 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 the best way of changing your karma is to keep your precepts make good, good charity and meditate that's the best way to change your karma and it's also much cheaper how much does it cost to get a Feng Shui master how much does it cost to keep precepts how much does it cost to come to meditation retreat <laughs> so this is great value for money coming here Bhante I learned Buddhism for the last five years I recognize it as a life teaching but I still cannot let go of traditional rites and rituals prayer which told me superstitious I suffer mental struggle and guilt to be Buddha's follower what should I do ah oh, take it easy just little by little let go of the past so don't force yourself after a while you do some of the ceremonies and the rituals and after a while you think well you know I don't really need to do so many of these things so cut back on it it's just like you have an addiction to say some um, sugar or addiction to meat or addiction to anything else don't stop it the go cold turkey just lessen the dose little by little by little by little and that way you can be more free but it's also you find that young people you know if they go to Buddhist temples and they see their grandma just shaking the incense and doing chanting and they haven't got a clue what's going on after a while they turn away from Buddhism if it's just pure superstition and rites and rituals they think what does this mean so it's actually great for us to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it then it's not superstition anymore so if you can explain to your grandchild what you're doing when you shake the incense and how it works fine if you can explain to your grandchildren you know, what all this charting is all about fine then it's not superstition anymore but if you don't know what it is and why you're doing it then it's superstition and your children won't follow it anymore so be careful understand what these rituals are and what's true what isn't true and then Buddhism will be very strong in your family otherwise if it's just based on superstition your next generation who get highly educated will turn away how can I help my pet dog to attain a good rebirth you know that you can uh, they do this in Australia and many other countries there's something called pet therapy where you take your dog usually dogs to cancer wards or old people's wards or maybe MS wards where people are suffering these very long debil debilitating illnesses and so the people in the cancer ward has a chance to pat and stroke the dog and the dogs are just so loving the research has shown it has a significant positive effect on the healing from a cancer more people go into remission because it's just these animals these pets can actually show love and care in a way which human beings can't they're even training some dogs to be able to sniff out cancers so early before any other medical equipment can know the cancer is coming such as cancers in the breast or the prostate the dogs can sense it before anything else can 
So these dogs who get trained in sort of sniffing cancers or going to pet therapy in hospitals, wow, they're making lots and lots of good karma. So, in hospitals in Penang, do they have pet therapy? Well, maybe if there's anyone who's in that profession, they can. It's been well researched in many countries. It has a great positive effect, and it's so simple. It's very cost-effective. It just doesn't cost much at all, and it gives your pet an opportunity to make good karma by helping people heal. But even so, I mean, your your pet does a lot of good karma towards you and your family by making you happy and healthy and well. So your pet is already making good karma. In, is people's praying in the temple superstitious? I ask that God or Buddha and always in your heart rather than some premises. So, is people praying in temple superstitious? Something that God or Buddha is always in your heart rather than some premises. People spending hundreds of thousands praying for God for return. Demand and supply seems happening in religion. Okay, a lot of people pray to God for all sorts of things. And of course they don't happen. But this, I was told this um, story in Singapore. Because sometimes that some parents are so desperate to pray for help for maybe their children who are suffering, they go anywhere. And so this Buddhist, they went to one of these uh, Christian evangelical meetings because their son was hard of hearing. He wasn't deaf, he was just hard of hearing. And she took him to one of these meetings now, just in case. He didn't really worry whether it was a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew or anything. She just wanted her son to get better. So when it was his turn to go onto the stage, you know, they, all they said, they said, here is a deaf boy. And she said, he's not deaf, he's just hard of hearing. He's a deaf boy. And the pastor put his uh, mouth right on the boy's ear and shouted, Jesus is calling you, can you hear? He said, yes, it's a miracle, hallelujah. <laughs> and everybody got up and shouted hallelujah. And the mother said, anyone can do that, he's not deaf, he's just hard of hearing. But because people wanted to believe, because they were superstitious, they thought it was another miracle. Now that's the problem, when you pray, pray, pray so much, you won't want so much for a sign that anything will do. And people actually believe in that. However, when people have done research, and there was actually research done in many universities throughout the United States to see whether praying actually works. So, they had, as in many scientific experiments, they gave people from all the different religions a set of names. Some were real people in cancer wards, some were fake people in cancer wards. And in the cancer wards, half of the people were being preyed on, half had no prayers for them at all. And they asked the doctors, in the last two or three weeks, when these people were being preyed on, and these other people did not receive any prayers. Is there any difference? Any unexpected change in the course of their disease? And it was a very large sample. And the doctors reported no significant change. Many of the churches got very upset. This was done in the United States. But the scientists were proving the chanting or the praying was not working. This was actually praying at a distance. However, if you actually go up to a person, you know, close to close, then that will have like a, a sense of increasing their energy, increasing their, their morale and confidence. That will have an effect. But chanting by itself was actually shown scientifically not to have much effect. Look at the research. 
Even many monks don't like that because that means they're going to lose all their ang pals. So if you really want your loved one to get well in hospital, just get them a good doctor, teach them how to do something for their good health by meditating, learning not to have worries, having a good attitude of mind. Play them some Dharma tapes. You know, if they're Chinese, in Chinese, not Ajahn Brahm's tapes in English, which they don't understand. Now that will be far more effective for them than chanting. Teaching them something they can understand. So they can have a positive mind state. Sometimes listening to chanting by your bedside sometimes can be very calming and soothing. Now that has a good effect. But just chanting for the sake of chanting or even at a distance. Next question. Okay, that's superstitious. How do you test something to see if it is superstition? How you test it is to find out how it could work. In other words, now find out the cause. If it's, say, transferring of merits, is that superstitious or not? And if you can't understand how it works, it will be superstitious. But transferring of merits actually can work. And this is actually how it does work. And it uses something which many of you have experienced for yourself. You may have a son or a daughter, say in London or New York, and they have an accident. Their car skids in the ice and they get taken to hospital. If that's your son or daughter, you will know that something has happened to them before they even SMS you. That's happened many, many times. A classic story was a vet who lived in Melbourne. This was in the Melbourne age and someone cut it out and sent it to me. He had finished work on a Friday afternoon and he got in his car and he was driving off to a country house for a weekend party with his friends. It was about two hours outside of Melbourne. Halfway along the motorway, he was overcome with very, very strong emotions. He didn't know why, but he just had to stop the car and cry and cry and cry. This was so out of character, he was a man, he didn't know why, but it was such strong emotions, he couldn't carry on driving, he had to stop, pull over and weep. It took him about 10 or 15 minutes to put himself together and he didn't know what on earth had happened and why until he got to the country house where there was a message waiting for him. At precisely the time he started to feel emotional, his dog had been run over and killed by a car. There's no way he could have known that, except that that was the dog he loved. And he straight away he knew that something had gone wrong, subconsciously, and just started crying. That is such a common experience that some of you may have had that experience. If it's someone you love and very close to, if they have any trouble or difficulty in another part of the world, you know immediately. And that same mechanism is how we transfer merits to our loved ones. Your grandma may be in a different plane of existence, but if you think of them now, they know, even subconsciously, that you're thinking of them. And whatever you transfer, especially if you transfer joy, happiness, gratitude, they know that, they receive it and the same mechanism. So if you do a great act of charity, kindness, goodness, and then you think of, say, your father who's passed away, you really have to think of them and focus on them, make that connection, then they receive it. And that's how it works. So that's not superstitious, because you understand how it works. If you can't understand how it works, there's no evidence for it, then it's superstition. There's a lot of questions here, so I better move through them quickly. Ajahn, uh, in reference to your remarks on homosexuals, I agree we should not discriminate with them, 
but we should know the following too. I guess the third precept of sexual misconduct is broken. No, it is not broken if you are homosexual. The third precept is uh, not to be unfaithful to your partner. Sometimes it's called adultery. And adultery means that you have a husband, you have a wife, and you decide to sleep with someone else who's not your husband, who's not your wife. So it is just breaking your marriage precepts. You know, that uh, you are not keeping uh, your sexual behavior to your partner. And that's the same with homosexuals. Many homosexuals have life partners. And if they are committed to that, say one homosexual boy has another life partner, another homosexual boy, if he sleeps with another boy, now he's breaking the third precept. But if he keeps within that one relationship, he's keeping his precepts. So that's actually that precept. So homosexuals can break that third precept. Uh, heterosexuals can also break that third precept. Whenever you're in a committed relationship and you sleep with someone outside that relationship, that's breaking your precept. And number two, Buddha said hermaphrodites cannot achieve arahatapala. Hermaphrodites are actually people with both sexes. In other words, they're people who are born, I think, with the male organ and the female organ. So it's not the, um, the homosexuals. So homosexuals, no problem. Uh, and something to share, one real craze, two stories. A bunch of guys beat up a transsexual and gave him a lecture and probably threatened him. Guess what? Two years later, one wife and two sweet kids. Does that mean the, the gay uh, decided to become straight and had sort of a wife and two kids? If that's the case, fine, he must have been someone who's not transsexual but bisexual. And a bisexual is a person uh, who uh, is attracted to both boys and girls, who sometimes you know, in between being gay and being straight. So they sometimes have boyfriends, sometimes girlfriends. So that must have been that particular case. But just to beat anybody up is a very bad thing to do. So I don't think that was uh, a case which we should uh, use as an example that next time you see a homosexual, beat them up and then they get married and have kids. So please don't do that. Next question. Many times in a day I recall things that I have planned to do, for example, writing this question or make an appointment with Mr. A or pass some documents to Mr. X when we meet. However, on my way to do it, I've forgotten about it because someone talked with me on the way or something happened or some other thoughts came to my mind. Sometimes I go to my room to take something, say a book. When I'm in the room, I have forgotten what I intended to do. This is very frustrating at times and it affects my work. I'm only 30 plus. Didn't say how much is plus. Maybe plus another 40 years. <laughs> Please explain what could have caused this and what can I do to overcome this. Thank you, Ajahn. One of the reasons why that you're forgetting things is because you're too stressed. Stress is known to affect your memory. So start to calm down. Don't do too many things at the same time. A busy person is not a person who does lots and lots of things. A busy person is one who does too many things at the same time. That's a busy person. You're doing too much at the same time. And actually you don't get much done. So if you do one thing at a time, some people think, oh, you're not busy at all, but you get much more done than other people. It's actually the way you work is efficiency. So if you have a calm mind, you tend to remember more. But when you fill your mind up with so much junk, it means you've got no room left to lodge any memories. 
So keep your mind nice and peaceful and it becomes very easy to remember things. And if there's something really important you have to remember, you can use what we say in meditation is called programming your mindfulness. And this is actually, I do this a lot. And it, for example, you have to call someone tomorrow at 9 a.m. So what do you do? Do you tie a string on your finger? Sometimes people do that, they tie a string on their finger to remember and they get up tomorrow morning and say, what's this string on my finger for? <laughs> or they write it down in their book, but they forget to open their book. Or they tell someone else, Amy, please remind me to call someone at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and Amy forgets to remind me. So what do you do? Programming mindfulness means you make your mind peaceful, very quickly. Just no thoughts. And then you tell yourself, I will ring up that person at 9 a.m. I will ring up that person at 9 a.m. tomorrow. I'll ring up that person at 9 a.m. tomorrow. You give very clear and precise instructions three times. You really listen to those instructions with mindfulness. And then you forget about it. And you'll be surprised how well this works. At 9 o'clock tomorrow, the thought will come up, oh, I've got to ring up somebody. It's just like an automatic wake-up call. And you'll be surprised how well that works. It's called auto-suggestion. And the most important thing to make sure it works is keep the instructions simple. And number two, pay attention when you're giving the instruction. And with those two things, you remember it. It's a very efficient way to make sure that you remember all these things you have to do. And the other thing, just keep it calm and peaceful throughout the day. Don't get excited, and then you'll have a much better memory. I have two nephews, A and B, age two plus. Early this year, A would cry furiously in the middle of the night, every night. He was also timid than normal, more timid than normal. A Chinese medium told my sister to pray to a deity near our home. Since then, A is back to his happy, active, normal self. Recently, B is crying for furiously at night instead. Sometimes when he is crying, he would look out the window, scared. What is the Buddhist explanation of such behavior? Is going to the medium and following his instructions superstitious? What should I do? It's an interesting question. It's very unlikely. Well, they're actually very young. Sometimes that might work. Obviously, if it's worked with one of the kids, you've just transferred the problem to the other. It just reminds me of that story of um, the chief priest, Venerable Damananda, when he was uh, still alive in Brickfields. Because he told me there was a very bad ghost in one of the houses in Brickfields. And he went to do the chanting to get rid of the ghost, and it worked. Sort of, because this, the ghost moved next door. And so the neighbors started to complain. And so eventually he had to go and chant in all of the, the houses in the neighborhood to make sure that when the ghost moved, it didn't just move next door, but went totally out of, the, out of Brickfield's neighborhood. So I'm not sure, maybe that might have happened over here. But it may be worthwhile doing. There are such things as local um, booters, we call them, but they're very low beings. They should not be really uh, messing around. So first of all, you may try that medium, give it a try. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, maybe go and see the doctor, make sure the kid's okay. But anyway, they're only two years of age. Usually these things, they just grow out of the kid naturally anyway. So that's my advice there. What is the origin and basis for the superstition that the number 13 is unlucky and walking under a ladder is unlucky? The number 13 is a Christian superstition because you had the 13th disciple who uh, cheated on Jesus. That's where it comes from. And Friday was the day when Jesus got executed. So Friday the 13th is a Christian superstition. So I'm a Buddhist, so I don't believe in that. <laughs> and walking under a ladder is superstitious. It's only because you know, the painter can drop the paint can on top of your head. If you walk outside the ladder, it won't fall on you. 
That's very clear what that superstition is. It's just not really a superstition at all. It's just no common sense. If you cannot walk under a ladder when a person's um, actually uh, working up there, it's obviously much safer. If you've been up a ladder, you do drop things. So that's the only reason for that. So that's not superstition, that's just common sense. <laughs> Next. Some say that Feng Shui is superstitious. However, there are cases where Feng Shui master's advice does show obvious effect when followed. For example, better business, less quarrels, etc. In my opinion, following Feng Shui with, no, with an open mind isn't superstitious. May I have your opinion? It can have some effect, but you know, if there's arguments in the family, it's much more than Feng Shui. You know, you, so you have to actually, if you can learn some you know, right attitudes when people are arguing, and one very uh, wonderful, effective attitude is someone is arguing right at you and shouting at you, when they finish, don't argue back yet. When they finish saying rotten things at you, pause for maybe 30 seconds. And that gives them the time to reflect on what they've just said. Because when you're quiet, the only thing they can know is what they've just said at you. And when you give them the chance to reflect on the bad speech they've just spoken, they usually say sorry. However, if as soon as they stop, then you start, they don't have an opportunity to know what they've just said. So especially in a marriage or in the office, if someone shouts at you and calls you terrible names, when they stop, don't try and defend yourself yet. Try 30 seconds, at least 10 seconds, to give them an opportunity for themselves to hear what they've just said. And that's much more effective than Feng Shui. So sometimes Feng Shui does work, it's, but it's many more powerful things than that. In the Chinese community we are surrounded with a lot of superstitions during delivery of a child, marriage and death. Do we as Buddhists follow the superstitions imposed upon us by relatives during these occasions so as not to offend them or should we ignore them? Yes, sometimes if it's like your grandmother and she's quite sure of what you should do, then just follow her to keep her happy. But when you're the grandmother, <laughs> you be more sensible. Because it's true that sometimes if it's your grandmother or mother, they're not going to change. They're not going to believe in the new ways of doing things. They say, this is the way it's done. When I was a girl, this is the way we're going to do it now. So just go ahead with that. But when it's your turn to be in charge of the funeral rites, you make it more meaningful and less superstitious. For example, you don't have to keep the body for a certain amount of days. You ask anybody who understands these things, who has experienced their previous lives or had NDEs, and you know the stream of consciousness leaves the body just when the brain stops working. So at the time of death, you're gone. You don't have to worry about doing an autopsy. Once you're dead, once you're pronounced dead, you can't feel anything. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to be superstitious. Well, if I'm cremated, it's going to hurt because I don't like fire. You don't feel anything. You don't have to be superstitious. My goodness, if I give my organs to charity, if I give my heart, then when I go to heaven, I won't have a heart. All those stupid superstitions, you should know that any charity which you have always has good results. So you can give all of your organs. If you give your eyes, as I said the other night, in heaven you'll have four eyes, more than anybody else. If you give your heart, you'll have a wonderful heart in your next life. Because whatever you give, you get back many times over. So please understand the reasons behind this. Ask good monks who are not just following what their teacher said, but who know these things through their deep meditation. And they will all tell you the same, that many of the superstitions surrounding death, you don't always have to follow them. Keep it simple, keep it rational, and it's a much better way forward. And especially if you donate your organs, it means other people who really need that kidney can have one.
and they can have a life when you don't need it anymore. As part of our culture and beliefs, we pray and make offerings to the soul of the dead person for 49 days after the person has passed away, with the belief that the soul is still around the house for 49 days. What are your thoughts on this? And after a person has passed away, does reincarnation take place instantaneously or only after 49 days? And I have an experience of the 49, 49 days rule actually being true. It's not just in Mahayana Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism, it's also in Theravada Buddhism because there was this one lady who had cancer when I was a monk in Thailand and as she got sicker and sicker we were looking after her, counseling her and when she died, because she was a, a close disciple of our monastery in Thailand I not only knew the day she died but I also helped perform the funeral service for her. And so we knew everything about her death, the time and all the events leading up to it. A few weeks later, her father came very early in the morning to our monastery. And I was there, he talked to me. The father was the treasurer of the monastery. And when he came to talk to me, I asked him, why have you come so early? And he said, because a strange thing happened last night. He said, we were having breakfast together, and there was about 13 people in the house. And like in Thailand, like in sort of uh, Penang in the old days, you put all the dishes on the floor and you sit around it. So I had everyone sitting around having their breakfast, and one of his other daughters said, oh, I had a strange dream last night. My sister came up to me and said, it's time for me to go. I'm taking leave. Bye-bye. And as soon as she said that, Everyone else went quiet and one by one they all said that they had had the very same dream that night. About 13 people had an identical dream of their sister coming to see them and saying, it's time to go, I'm taking leave. And it was so spooky, he came to see me and asked, what does this mean, what's going on? And I said, She's come to take leave. <laughs> Obvious. And as soon as they left, I looked at the calendar and counted the days. Exactly 49. And that was a case where she had waited 49 days and then she'd gone and taken a rebirth. She's a really good woman. So, there was one case which was very clear the stream of consciousness had waited 49 days to take rebirth. But I'm not sure why it is 49 days. Maybe it's just the case that it gives time for all the funeral ceremonies to be complete, for life to get back to normal in the house again. Maybe that's the time. But certainly, that was one case where it was 49 days. However, that is only a general rule. Some people are born, reborn almost immediately and some people stay around for much longer. But it is a general rule. So if you want to do some merit making for 49 days, fine. Because it does seem to have a meaning behind it. So that's all I can say about that one. Next question, Ajahn Brahm. Meditation question. Is it okay if I don't want to get up when I'm meditating? Yeah. If you're having a happy time and you're meditating, just carry on. You can meditate as long as you like. I don't know if I told this story the last time I was here, but there was a Vietnamese monk in Australia, about, I think maybe about 18 months ago or some time ago, and he was teaching a nine-day meditation retreat, similar to what we teach here. And he came and he was... Uh, in the late eve afternoon he arrived and they started by doing like half an hour meditation I think it was on a Friday evening and then he was going to give a talk and then people go back to bed get up early in the morning do some chanting or whatever just like a normal nine day retreat but after one hour he hadn't come out of his meditation to do the, uh, the eight precepts and give the talk hour and a half, two hours he was still sitting there. Three hours, he hadn't moved. So all the yogis thought, we're not going to get a talk tonight. 
So they all went back to bed. He was just sitting there. They got up in the morning, he was still sitting there, hadn't moved, hadn't gone to the toilet, hadn't laid down, hadn't taken any water. And so they sat with him. When it came to breakfast time, he was still sitting there. They went to breakfast, he just sat there. They came back afterwards for the morning talk, he was still sitting in meditation, never gave any talks. Lunch time, he was still sitting there. He never moved for nine days. And when he came out of his meditation, he said, oh, look, I'm terribly sorry that I didn't give you any talks. I just got into a nice deep meditation. And they said, oh no, Bhante, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That was the best Dharma talk we ever get, uh, heard. To see a monk who could actually meditate for nine days without moving. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So if you want to do that, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. A last a yogi who can actually sit still for, how many more days have we got left? So if you, now that was an exceptional monk, I don't think you're going to do that. But sometimes it does happen, you get into a nice deep state of meditation, just carry on, enjoy it. You can have lunch, you can have breakfast any day. But to get into deep meditation, that's very rare. So if it's happening, just carry on. The Ajahn, what can parents do to protect their children from the influence of violent scenes, programs on TV, internet, etc.? Even with children who have some Dharma exposure, when young we see them change uh, once they're exposed to these influences. What can we do? Thank you. That's a really difficult question. I know that many governments are trying to have filters on the internet which can actually filter out any violent or sexual scenes for their kids. It's coming, but many people tell me that smart kid can always get around any filter. And it's the same with on TVs. They try and limit the violence to later on in the evening when the children are supposed to be in bed. But you know what children are like. Sometimes they can find ways around these things. So sometimes as parents you can try your very best. But you know that your children will be exposed to these things. So somehow you can have to teach your children that even though you're exposed to these things, this is just a cartoon. This is just a movie, it's not real life. Because in real life when you hit someone, they hit you back. And the blood is real blood. And the pain is not some just words on the screen. The pain actually hurts. So somehow we've got to make uh, the connection that real life is real life and what's on the internet or on the TV is a different world altogether. And please don't confuse the two. It's a tough one, but we need to do that. And really that's not just the job of the parents or the monks, sometimes that's the job of governments as well. And it's really like trying to play catch up all the time. But that being said, there's many kids who have watched the violent movies or played the violent video games and they're fine children. And it's just entertainment for them and it's just, they can take it in their stride. But there's always these few very sensitive children who just cannot make the distinction. And what they see in the videos, they act out in real life. And they're the dangerous ones. And hopefully, the parents and especially the teachers in school can actually notice those kids who have a propensity to act out the fantasies which they see on the internet in real life and they're the ones who need special attention. But most of your kids will be okay. I remember as a kid watching Tom and Jerry cartoons and that cat was always getting beaten up, blown up, smashed to bits you remember Tom and Jerry? And I didn't turn out to be a violent monk. <laughs> so really some kids can take this and they realize it's just a cartoon, that's all. For those kids who don't know the difference between cartoons and real life, they're the problems. People who passed away in sudden e.g. accident, usually they don't know that they had just died. They will wander in our world until their karma ripens and they get reborn. Is that true? Yet sometimes it's the case, it's quite rare that you know, the monk goes along and sees the ghost and just have to tell him, look, you're dead, you're died, okay? Because sometimes they don't realize that. Because remember, sometimes if a person's died, 
especially if they've not been a meditator, sometimes their mindfulness is so dull, it's like sometimes you're in a dream. Have you ever been in a dream, you're not quite sure whether you're awake or whether you're in a dream? And it's that type of mindfulness there, it's not clear at all. So the person doesn't realize what they're doing and that they're really dead. And sometimes a good monk or a good sort of meditator can actually see them and say, look, you're dead. And you can contact them and they can understand, oh yeah, I'm dead. And then they can leave. But it's rare that happens, but it does happen. Most people know straight away they died. We have a very good friend who is a Christian. She has recently lost a son in an accident. This man was the best son anyone could have. She is now totally devastated. How can we help? There is a story which is in Open the Door of Your Heart about the concert simile. I'm not going to tell it because I haven't really got time. You can get the book from Suki Hotu. Read the simile of the concert. It's a wonderful story which shows that how you can turn the grief which is there in the loss of a dearly loved one into something far more positive. Basically, when a concert finishes, if it's a wonderful performance, no one ever feels sad after a great performance. After you've been to a musical concert, you felt, wow, how wonderful that was, how lucky I was to have been there at the time. And that's the way that we look at death. What a wonderful time she had with her son. How blessed she was to have a wonderful boy like that. Maybe the concert never went on as long as she would have liked, but at least she had those years with that boy. How lucky I was to have known him for that time. And then the grief is turned around into something positive. Feeling blessed that she's had that son. What a lucky woman she was. But you can see the full story in Opening the Door of Your Heart. Since my father passed away, my mother said she is living with no purpose. She came down with illness and became underweight. No matter what I do for her, it is never good enough for her. She has lots of anger inside her. Why is she finishing herself, punishing herself? What can I do for her? If the person is still in grief and negativity by punishing herself, sometimes all it takes is maybe a, a CD or a book you know, of Dharma which she picks up and that can somehow change the whole way she looks at things. The purpose of life is not defined by your partner because sometimes we all have loved ones who pass away. There's much more purpose to life than just your marriage and relationship, even though that's important. So we need to somehow give her a further purpose for life. And one of those ways is like service to others, you know, going out to meet other people rather than staying at home, looking after the temple or whatever, I'm not quite sure what religion she is, or whether she can speak English or just Chinese or Malay or whatever. But if you can somehow take her out of the house, you know, out into the world where she's doing something for others, then maybe she will realize there is more purpose to life. It also depends how old she is. If she really is at the close of her life, she probably wants, well, I'm just going to wait to die to get back to my, uh, my uh, husband. So sometimes when people have been married for such a long time and they've been very close to each other, then sometimes they're just trying to die as soon as possible to get reunited again. That may be her case. So it really depends on her age. If she really has got many years left in her, she's not going to die soon. And see if she can do some social service especially. Or, if that's you who wrote this question, that's your mother. I don't know if you have a kid yet, but if she has a grandchild, sometimes grandmothers change almost immediately. There's one lady I know in Bangkok, she was getting very, very sick and was very concerned for her, I thought she might die. Then she had a granddaughter and she suddenly got much, much better. Because <laughs> sometimes grandchildren give their grandparents a, per, a, a reason to live. So there's many, many solutions there, but it, the question was not specific enough for me to give a, a specific answer. Why most meditators look stressed and solemn during meditation? Oh my goodness. That must mean they've got a bad teacher. 
Ah, come on! Smile when you're meditating. I told this to one person during the interviews. During meditation, if you're not getting anywhere, take your attention away from your breath, away from your body, whatever else you're watching, put it on your mouth and smile. Just try smiling when you're meditating and you will find the meditation goes much more easily. I even learned this when I was at Cambridge because I just got myself talked in to join in the boat club. So we would like row in these races, in these eights. I never actually rowed for Cambridge, I was never that good. But I you know, used to row in college boats, you know, in an eight, up the river. And sometimes that was really hard work. And I remember one occasion, we were in this race and it was really tough and I was getting very tired. And the coach shouted out at me saying, you're making an ugly face, smile. And I followed his advice and coaches know this, if you smile it's easier to pull the oar. You get more energy. If you grimace it's harder. Now we know that in sport and that also happens in meditation. If you watch the breath with a grimace, it's hard to keep awareness of the breath. If you watch it with a smile, it's much easier to do. And for that reason, when people ask me about posture, should I sit in the lotus posture, in the half lotus Burmese position, you know, uh, with my legs out on a chair, back straight, left hand over the right hand or right hand over the left hand, how should I sit? I say the only important part of your physical posture is your mouth. <laughs> smile for goodness sake. If you smile, that's the only important part of your posture to keep. So that's a good question. So please, sort of look a bit more cheerful. Why are monks are so solemn? Many monks are not cheerful like you. I made a resolution when I was looking to join a monastery or follow a tradition. I was in London and in London they had monks from all the different nations. And the reason why I went to Thailand to become a monk was because in London the Thai monks smiled the most. And that was true. And I thought, look, if somebody is ending suffering, they should look happy. And I made a resolution, I'm never going to follow a miserable looking monk. <laughs> if they're not happy, if they haven't made their own happiness yet, how can they make mine? So when he went to someone like Ajahn Chah, he was a very happy monk. So there are some happy monks, there are some miserable monks. Miserable monks, they don't know what they're talking about. Fortunately, Naven Indaratana here, he was a very happy monk. So he's a very good monk. So always follow happy monks and happy nuns. In the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha how to deal with women. Buddha said, don't see them. Ananda asked if I see, don't talk to them. Ananda asked if I talk, be mindful in talking. So how can this method imply in daily life? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Now number one, he was talking to Ananda. And at that time, Ananda, he was a very lustful monk. There's some stories about some of his lust. So this was specific to him because you know, he was in danger, as it were, of getting into lust. So he was saying, look, Ananda, this is not just for everybody, but if, if you come across a beautiful woman, just don't look. Because otherwise he looks. Ooh, I'm not supposed to look. I'm not supposed to. Because <laughs> then it just gets him even more lust. He said, if you have to look, now don't talk. Because when he gets talking, especially just talking one on one, those of you who come to the interviews, you know I've always got a chaperone there. And the chaperone is not to protect me in case you jump on me. <laughs> All it is when there's another monk there, it means there's no way that you know, the woman actually can get into any type of misunderstandings like flirting. But if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it might be a good monk, a very good girl, 
but sometimes chemistry and sometimes just these things happen despite your best intentions. So we protect ourselves that way. So he says, you know, if you see one, don't look at them. And what I usually tell my monks, if you have to look at them and it's a very beautiful girl, try and find her pimple <laughs> or some defect somewhere. Because the trouble with lust is we think, oh, you're totally beautiful. The story which my teacher said, because this was one of my own stories, I was in the back of a car. We were going from the monastery Wat Ba Pong to the train station in Warin in northeast Thailand. The driver was driving the car, Ajahn Chah was in the front passenger seat and there were three monks in the back. It was myself, the translator and this young American novice. And halfway on the journey, Ajahn Chah turned around to the novice and said in Thai, you're thinking of your girlfriend. And he was. Ajahn Chah had read his mind. So be very careful. Don't think sexy thoughts in front of good monks. We know what you're thinking about. <laughs> so, the poor novice monk was surprised. He said, yes, I was. You caught me out. And then Ajahn Chah said to the interpreter, it doesn't matter, we can help you. So the next time you write to your girlfriend back in the United States, ask her to send something of hers, something personal, so when you miss her, you can take it out to remember her by. And the novice said, is that allowable as a monk? Ajahn Chah said, yes, 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 yes. When I heard this, I was quite surprised. I never thought Ajahn Chah was romantic. Because <laughs> you know what it's like. You know, you may have like your boyfriend is over in Australia. You know, your girlfriend is, you know, has gone to China. And you miss her. So you have something of hers. So when you miss her, you can take it out. Oh, that's something special. So he said, what should I ask her for? And Ajahn Shah, next time you write to her, ask her to send you some of her shit <laughs> in a little bottle. So whenever you miss her, you can take out the stop of the bottle and smell her. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's my girlfriend back in the United States. <laughs> Ajahn Shah was gross sometimes, but it's very funny. So that's Ajahn Chah, how a monk should deal with a girlfriend. <laughs> All he was doing, and same with, monk, with nuns and men as well, it's just especially for monks and for nuns, because we're celibate, you know, we've given up sex, so we want to make sure we keep it like that for a long time. So sometimes we have to be careful and restrained. So that's all that one is about. Maybe this is the last question because it's running out of time and the other questions here I will answer tomorrow. Ajahn, the eight precepts include not listening to music. I am musically inclined and play several musical instruments. Question, is music viewed as generally unwholesome? Is musical talent regarded as a defilement then? No, it's only that when you're meditating, you know, you don't want to be distracted by music. And of course, there's many different types of music. You know, and some music can be very negative, like punk rock, where you want to kill everybody. Who was that? There's one musician who was always into talking about suicide or something. I don't know who it was. But anyway, that some music can be quite negative, but some music can be quite softening. And I do actually tell some people who are very stressed out, they can actually listen to some soft music before they start meditating. You know, not sort of hard rock, which excites you, but very, very gentle music. And that just relaxes you, and then when you've relaxed, then you can turn the music off and meditate. But that's at home. But when you're on a retreat, you shouldn't really need that. So because of that, when we're on a retreat, when that's when we're keeping eight precepts, that's when we stop listening to music. It's the same, there's nothing wrong with eating in the evening. It's just, it's not immoral to do that. 
just when we're on retreat, we try and have more time to meditate. That's why we give up the evening meal. So there's nothing wrong with listening to music. It's just we try and avoid it when we're on retreat, when we're keeping eight precepts. And outside of retreat, fine, you can listen to music. You know, but don't spend all your time listening to music and choose the music which is not going to you know, overly excite you. And enjoy, especially young people, you like listening to rock music and enjoying yourself, fine. You know, I used to listen to Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin when I was young and I still had good meditation but I never listened to those things while I was on meditation retreat. So that's how you should do it. Is there any questions about that one? Okay, so thank you for listening and thank you for especially all those questions and those people whose questions weren't answered tonight uh, you have special good karma because you're more patient than everybody else. So thank you for waiting. So now we'll do the sharing of the merits and you know this is not superstition I showed you how it works, so if you want to share the merits with a particular person, visualize them, think of them as best you can, and then wherever they are, they will know you're thinking about them, and the merits will thereby be transferred. Idam ho tu sukita hon tu yatayo Idam me yati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo Idam me yati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo Sadhu, sadhu do. Very good. So have a happy night. I hope you could hear the uh, answers to the questions over the music. Did, could you hear at the back or was it difficult? Was it difficult with the music outside to hear the talk tonight? No. Yes, it was. Okay, sorry about that. But tomorrow night, I'm sure, will be much better. So thank you for coming.